Okay, good afternoon everyone, online and physical. Uh, welcome to the Silta Victoria 2021 Annual General Meeting. Uh, we have today two guest speakers prior to the formalities um, of the AGM itself. I would like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Michael Percy and Mr. John Poliak. Uh, Michael is uh, a fellow of SILTA, which is, which is great. Um, he's also a senior lecturer in political science at the University of Canberra. And he works in tag team uh, with John Poliak, who is the founder of Key Numbers. Uh, John and Michael, their biggest love in the world at the moment is hydrogen. And uh, as we all know, it's an emerging technology. It's, it is going to be one of the omnipresent things in the future. John and Michael, I'll throw over to you guys to tell us all about hydrogen. Okay, take it away, uh, Michael and John, over to you. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Um, look, and I wish you all, all the best with your AGM. J John um, has... Uh, experience internationally in the energy industry, and this is really sort of his um, his area in terms of the, the the numbers. And this key numbers system that he has is designed to facilitate these types of discussions. And hopefully, at the end of this session, you will see the usefulness of this platform that he's developed. Um, and we've used this previously when we looked at electric vehicles and comparing the road use charge in uh, Victoria with the um, fuel excise, and it was very helpful around there. But look, my, my interest in this is more around the, the political side of it, and I'm going to talk about some of those uh, things today. Um, so, John, if you'd go to the next slide, and I'll just give you an overview of what we're going to look at. Really, what we've seen in the media, uh, particularly from the Minister for Energy at the federal level, Ang Angus Taylor, who's actually my local representative, uh, there's a real sort of buzz about hydrogen at the moment. And what we wanted to do today was to talk to you about what all the fuss is about. And we wanted to look at some... Uh, I, I spoke with uh, some of your colleagues in, in the Victorian chapter um, at the AGM, National AGM, the other day and just asked about the sorts of things you might be interested in. And we came up with looking at, firstly, why hydrogen? And then we wanted to look at, does hydrogen plug the renewals, renewables gap, which is what um, the federal government is looking at it being capable of doing? What we also see is that it means moving from uh, high to low density means of uh, providing energy, which means we actually have more volume to move. And this is particularly interesting to our organisation, looking at the logistics uh, and the transport around that. Um, so what we want to do today is look at, is hydrogen cost effective? And then we want to talk about the policy landscape and hydrogen. And I guess we're not trying to be sceptical so much uh, about hydrogen as it is at present. But there's very much a crystal balling sort of effect that the government is trying to use here. And in many ways, it's trying to bet on hydrogen as being one of the major solutions to uh, climate change and uh, among other things. Um, so, look, we'll talk about some of the politics uh, around that uh, as well, rather than getting into the detail about um, environmental politics. We want to more talk about why hydrogen, why has it been chosen? If you go to the next slide, please, John. So why hydrogen? Well, it's a move away from fossil fuels driven by the idea of climate change and trying to reduce carbon emissions. Now, one of the biggest problems of renewables, particularly wind and solar, is that it's not necessarily dispatchable. And by dispatchable, we mean being able to be deployed on demand. So if there's no wind or there's no sun, then unless you have a reliable battery source, which is still problematic, uh, it, as, as we've seen in South Australia, uh, you know, it's, it's great for, um, for certain, um, in certain circumstances, but it's not as reliable as what we've become accustomed to from coal-generated power. Um, that's not to say that it won't be in the future, but at the moment, renewables aren't dispatchable. So if we can bring hydrogen into the mix, there's a general idea that hydrogen can uh, plug that gap. And, and John will show you some of the figures around this shortly. So hydrogen can be produced from multiple sources. And just to sort of, I want you to try and remember these three key things because we're going to, we're going to be talking about this when we look at the actual figures. So hydrogen needs to be produced using something. And in general, it's produced using natural gas. Now, if you use natural gas where you just burn the gas to produce the hydrogen, the hydrogen that's produced is called grey hydrogen. 
So it's not necessarily environmentally friendly. Now, what we're hearing from particularly Angus Taylor at the moment is this idea of um, clean hydrogen, which is also known as blue hydrogen. And what that means is that you burn natural gas to produce hydrogen, but you capture the carbon emissions uh, in, in whatever way so that the carbon emissions are reduced and then you have hydrogen, which is, uh, you know, in effect, clean. Now, if you use renewable energy uh, to develop your hydrogen, it's then known as green hydrogen. Now, of course, this means that you're using wind, solar, hydro, et cetera, uh, to produce your hydrogen. So the emissions are already much less. But what we want to do is we want to look at what does it mean at the current state of play of the differences between grey, blue, and green hydrogen. And if you can just remember, grey means dirty, blue means it's been cleaned by capturing the carbon, and green means it's been produced by renewables. So when we get to that section, if we can just keep that in mind, it'll, it'll help with the understanding of the, the, the figures. Now, one of the benefits of hydrogen is that we can actually use existing infrastructure to deliver hydrogen. And it could be through existing gas pipes and also through petrol stations. Whereas if we look at things like electric vehicles, for example, we don't have the infrastructure, we actually have to build it. Whereas it would be a case of just modifying to some extent the existing infrastructure. And to put it in perspective, this idea of blue or clean hydrogen is actually being added to gas lines uh, by a, an experimental project that the um, uh, Angus Taylor spoke about just recently. Now, some of the trade-offs though, are that the volume of hydrogen that you need to get the same effect at present increases the logistics uh, of moving that, um, that fuel around. There's also then the cost effectiveness of uh, carbon equivalent emissions. So, so, you know, how much does it cost versus the actual emissions? And then finally, um, we have the problem of the existing infrastructure is that hydrogen, because it's the lightest element, actually causes embrittlement of the existing infrastructure. So anything sto to store hydrogen you can't simply use the natural gas storage or transmission methods like pipes because you would have to convert those uh, in, in some way. Now, that's not to say that you can't use the existing rights of way that the pipes have or the existing locations of the petrol stations, but it's not as simple as simply just swapping gasoline for hydrogen, so to speak. Um, so that's the general overview. Uh, next slide, please, John. And uh, John now is going to talk you through uh, these things that I've just outlined by using a number of different graphs and approaches. So thanks, John. Hi, um, thanks. I'm John Poljak from Key Numbers. Uh, my background is actually oil and gas. So, um, and I've run around the world kind of like setting up systems and getting an understanding of energy systems in general. Um, a lot of the times it's difficult to kind of comprehend what we mean by dispatchability. Um, if you look at the graph, the orange line is basically a day in the life of, um, sorry, it's actually just one of the day, one day in, uh, sorry, a week in Victoria um, back in 2019. So the orange represents the uh, electricity use per day um, by the state. So usually it goes from about 4,000 to about up to 6,000, 7,000 megawatts per, per, sorry, per day, sorry, megawatt hours per day. The blue represents, I've just done a hypothetical in terms of like, let's just put in wind and solar and can we match the, um, can we match the, uh, the consumption? So at the moment it's kind of close, but it's not quite close. So what we can actually do, I'm just going to quickly just kind of revisualize it so it'll be flicker a bit here and all that i'm just going to assume okay let's assume that let's put all the uh, sunny windy days to the left and then the the cloudy kind of still days to the right what you can see here is that this right hand side is our dispatchability problem we want electricity but we can't get it it's just not enough sunny days um, theoretically we can kind of like uh, we can basically oversize um, the electricity but at some point it's just going to become un un uneconomical so we need some sort of storage mechanism or some sort of um, other technology that can kind of like uh, cover the gap. So that's what we mean by dispatchability. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is um, I'm just going to give a sense of like uh, Michael just quickly mentioned, for example, uh, the different colors of um, hydrogen. Now, the first part is, is that it, it, what we're trying to solve here is climate change. So if we're looking at, for example, natural gas, uh, for every megajoule of nat natural gas that you use, you basically burn, sorry, every megajoule of natural gas that you burn, uh, it's about 50 grams. To, to give that into context, uh, if I looked at, I found like a, a typical Victorian house of four people, they do about 50, I think it's like um, 56,000 megajoules per year 
Now, so that works out to be about two, about two to three, sorry, about almost close to three tons of CO2 per family, just for the natural gas consumption and all that. So the question is, does hydrogen reduce that amount? So um, if I just say, right, gray hydrogen, what I'm actually doing is a process that takes, uh, I, need, I need energy to create energy. So that actually results in actually more CO2 emissions. So for every, say, megajoule of hydrogen, I'm actually producing 70 grams of CO2. So it's actually about 30, what was that, 30% more or something like that. So, so I'm actually producing a lot more. So one of the options is, is that I could go with blue hydrogen. So what we mean by blue hydrogen is I'm capturing the, the, the natural gas, sorry, the CO2 emissions. And usually people talk in terms of like, say, CCS in terms of 90% capture rates. The last 10% is basically really expensive. So here we can see here that I basically captured. So instead of got 70 grams, I've got eight grams of CO2. So effectively from natural gas, I'm capturing about 80% of, it. I'm reducing my emissions by about 80%. And this is what you're seeing with the federal government. I think it's like they're kind of very much pushing for these kind of um, say, what they see as cost-effective solutions. The one problem with that is that we're not too done. So as um, uh, Michael was alluding to, um, you get emissions from the system as well. So basically hydrogen leaks, but also methane, uh, natural gas leaks as well. So the big question is, is that if we have a, um, the International Energy Agency says that um, hydrogen, basically natural gas leaks, if you get a 1% leak, one molecule of, of uh, methane, oh, sorry, natural gas is methane, one molecule of natural gas is the equivalent of 84 molecules of CO2 over a 20 year, over a 20 year time frame gets down to about 25 over a hundred year period. So if I've got a 1% leak in my system and assuming that basically, okay, I'm not capturing 60, uh, 90%, I'm capturing only 60% of the emissions. Basically i have get no, no benefit. You can see that we get to no benefit or anything like that. So what you're finding is that with hydrogen, it's really the, the, the provenance of that hydrogen is going to be critical. Now, if you got like, say, hydrogen coming in, sorry, natural gas coming in from Russia, you could be talking 3% emissions. So effectively, um, making hydrogen from Russian gas might cost you basically may, mean double the amount of emissions. So effectively, not only just not, not, not only solving the problem, you're actually creating double, you're doubling the problem and all that. Of course, the fossil fuel industry will say, actually, trust this. And if you look at places like Norway, they can get it close to 0%. And then, you know, like 0.3% is kind of the emissions around Norway. But again, a lot of the uh, energy systems are around kind of, say, uh, challenging places, the Middle East, Africa, and Russia, and all that. So that's the side of it. The other question is also is that you can, people can say, right, we're going to make emissions from, say, um, from uh, electricity. So we can make hydrogen from electricity. So uh, a lot of times we'll say that's green hydrogen. So when it's windy or solar and all that, um, you're producing electricity from there, that's emissions free. So basically the hydrogen is emissions free as well. We really have to watch out what we mean by like uh, green hydrogen or for example, um, uh, because a lot of times people are now saying, are confusing um, hydrogen from electrolyzers, uh, which is the big machine that basically turns electricity into hydrogen versus um, uh, say uh, getting electricity from the grid. Now, Victoria's actually got some of the dirtiest, apologies, I'm not kind of trying to blame Victorians, but you've got some of the dirtiest electricity in, in not only Australia, but globally. So for every kilowatt hour of electricity that you produce in Victoria, you're producing one kilo of CO2. So if we were to say basically, right, we're gonna go with electrolyzers and we're gonna produce um, uh, hydrogen from, 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 the, uh, from the grid, effectively just because we need about 47 to 50 kilowatt hours of electricity to make one kilo of hydrogen, you're effectively basically to get, you're, you're effectively producing 376 grams of hydrogen, um, uh, sorry, CO2 from, from that hydrogen. Now to put that into context, that family that was producing two, close to three tons of CO2, if they basically produced, if they use hydrogen from using grid electricity, their CO2 emissions go from three, three tons per year to 20 tons per year. So of course it's not gonna happen. They'll clean up the grid and everything will be good, but it's something to be watchful for whenever you're looking at say hydrogen numbers and all that, like what's the source of electricity? So that's the critical part about that side of things. So we also talked about, for example, the, um, the, the logistics. We're going from a high energy, sorry, high density energy to a low density energy. So these are the, some of the things that I've come across. Now, um, 
again, if you look at a petrol tanker at the moment, in America, it's of 92,000 gallons. That works out to be 35,000 litres. So every time you see these petrol tankers, they're going off to the local, they're doing the last mile. They're going off and they're basically filling up the local, you know, BP or Shell or uh, metro stations. What would happen in a hydrogen world? So hydrogen is a very light chemical, but it also is very, uh, say, low density. So in America, um, you can only have a, a, a basically a, um, a hydrogen tanker that can store 300 kilos. So instead of basically, so at the moment, and you need a lot of steel and kind of material to kind of keep that compressed. So the light, the hydrogen is very light, but the compression of that and the technology to compress it is really heavy. So if you were to look at it from an energy content point of view, you've got one tanker that does 35,000 liters of petrol. You're basically gonna need 31 tankers of hydrogen to get the energy equivalent. So it's gonna be a lot more tankers on the road. Of course, it won't be 300 kilos. They'll come up with lighter technologies. And this is, uh, you know, like um, the start of the industry. But basically, you're going to have to see a lot more transport to kind of carry the energy around the system. So that was on the trucking side. To give you an example on, the, say, the shipping side is the same principle applies with when we're talking, say, exporting energy as well. So at the moment, let's assume we've got one unit of LNG. If you look at other technologies like, like hydrogen, say liquefying hydrogen, for the one unit of LNG, you basically have to basically um, uh, need two and a half units of hydrogen. So you're gonna need two and a half times as many ships to kind of export out hydrogen to say like China, uh, Japan or, or Korea. Ammonia is a bit better. So a lot of the times you'll talk in terms of say, um, uh, converting hydrogen into another carrier of energy such as ammonia or uh, metal hydrate or um, uh, LOHCs. Uh, um, and these are kind of like, but again, using up a lot more energy to kind of like store it. You're using up a lot of energy to create energy, and then you got to, you'll lose it on the way on when it gets to the other side, and basically has to be converted back to hydrogen. So there's real challenges in terms of basically the amount of ships. The other issue is like, for example, just on air transport. So a lot of the times the, you know, the graphic designers will come through with some fancy graph and all that, um, showing you know some sleek plane that's going to be the future of hydrogen transport and all that, or hydrogen flight. So here's just some simple numbers. Um, a Boeing 747 has about 854 uh, cubic meters of, uh, of um, cargo space. And it needs about 230 uh, cubic meters of fuel to kind of basically push that plane through the air and kind of get it to the other side. So if we were to do the equivalent of like, because it's basically uh, jet fuel is about 35 megajoules per liter, hydrogen at liquid hydrogen, which is the basically the coldest uh, form has 8.5 megajoules per liter. So what you, what you need is basically, you're gonna need four or five times as much volume to kind of um, uh, keep as much, to, for that energy to be stored to get that plane to the other side. Now, if you've got more, en more volume for the, for the energy, you've got less volume for your cargo. So that your little yellow spot there that I had in a traditional plane now becomes a smaller, smaller spot and all that. So that's what space you've got left. Now, if that's liquid hydrogen, so it's a lot more expensive to compress that. If you were to go with like, say hydrogen from like, say at 690 bar, which is effectively, I think what the Toyota Mirai or like those hydrogen cars doing, not only would you have no space for your, for your fuel, you'd actually, sorry, it's, it's a 4.5 megajoules per liter. So again, it's half the, it's basically double the volume of liquid hydrogen. You'd need a second plane to basically fuel the first plane. So it's basically uh, not quite practical at the moment. Now. We're not being negative on this at the moment. This is a nascent, in this nascent technology and there's gonna be a lot of smart people out there. They're gonna come up with some interesting technologies. So on the hydrogen plane side of things, you'll be looking at not just kind of burning hydrogen just to kind of push it through the sky. You'll be looking at hydrogen electric uh, engines to kind of like ensure, you know, um, you'll be looking at different say, um, you know, materials to kind of make the plane lighter, different shapes. But just as we saw with the, the Boeing issues with their uh, Airbus, um, their Supermax planes and all that, these things require a lot of time to certify. So any type of new technologies, you're looking at like, you know, years away before you can even think about that kind of stuff and all that. So um, so I think with the air transport, I think you'll see people kind of pushing for maybe other, say, um, uh, easier wins. So for example, like say biofuels or something like that, or just, you know, carbon offsets might be the other option as well. But again, uh, it's something to look for in the future. And I think we'll, it'll be an interesting area to kind of like um, to see how uh, the engineers tackle these issues and all that. Okay. I guess I'm just going to flip now back to, cost, um, to key numbers again. So I guess the thing is, is that um, 
you know, like a lot of the times, you know, we're talking in terms of a new unit and uh, sorry, um, uh, the, the critical part is, is uh, we need to look at the costs as well. Um, if you can bring the costs down, the logistics issues, no one's going to care about as long as the profitability is there. So let's look at it from like, say, a trucking operation and all that. Uh, how much are you paying for diesel fuel at the moment? Maybe $1.50, it's getting expensive, maybe up to $2, $2 a litre. Okay. Hydrogen is funny because now we're basically pricing things in kilos of hydrogen. So as an example, uh, again, these are American figures. So um, I got these figures from American websites. So uh, um, they may sl be slightly different in Australia. Um, if you're looking at like a, an articulated truck or in America, class eight, um, they basically do 32, I think I found 32 liters for every hundred kilometers. A hydrogen truck will get you eight kilos for every, uh, you'll need about eight kilos for every hundred kilometers. Couple simple bits of maths. So let's assume that, okay. Uh, let's assume that in, in Canberra at the moment, you can buy it for about 15 bucks a kilo. That's equivalent of $3.68 a, uh, a litre for diesel. So it'd be the equivalent of basically doubling your fuel costs. Now, again, we're at the very early stages. So once they scale these up and they basically make things cheaper, you get things cheaper. Now, and what you'll see, for example, is for, um, uh, the Prime Minister is always talking about $2 a litre, $2 a kilo. Now, if they get to $2 a kilo, we're all moving to hydrogen. That gets to about 50 cents a litre equivalent. But the reality is, it's mostly going to be somewhere closer to $5. Uh, 5 to $6, sorry, I would say $6 and all that. So it's about the equivalent. So it's going to be like a diesel price equivalent. So the question is, is that, okay, where are we now? So um, there was an announcement in Perth, as an example, the Infinite Blue Aerosmith project. They announced that it's $350 million, producing 25,000 tonnes of, uh, of hydrogen per day. Now, again, if they get their electricity at 60 bucks a megawatt hour, that wholesale price or the production cost alone is going to be about $6 a kilo. Okay, so it's going to be, it's quite expensive. So in order for them to get down to quite, you know, to say like two bucks a kilo, they're going to have to drop that number to about, I don't know, and they'll have to get their electricity, not for $60, but for $10. Okay, maybe about $15 or something like that, or 20. Okay. So, they, you're talking still multiples of like, I'll say like they're going to have to reduce the price of like, of, you know, like a solar and uh, wind farms from like a third of what they are at the moment. So the cost curves have come down a lot in the last like say 10 years and they have to keep on going that for a lot lower. And for me, if I can take one thing out of this, say if I can kind of present one thing out of this main thing is like, is that the, the, the key to, to hydrogen is cheap renewables electrolyzers themselves is going to be, you know, okay, you'll get the price down, but it's all about cheap renewables. So here's the thing. So the prime minister has talked about $2 a kilo. So let's work. So we get there. Does that solve our problem? Again, we're back to the logistics issue. Um, I'll take you through a slide in a second, but basically when we see the production costs of six bucks, so let's say we get back up to six bucks and all that one, or even if let's say even we get to $2, we still got delivery costs and refueling costs. So basically, you know, we talked about like the extra number of trucks to get there. It'd be more expensive to compress. Um, you've got refueling stations that need to be kind of redone and all that. Um, there hasn't been many studies done in Australia, but like I can show you, I'll go back to the PowerPoint now and all that. Um, okay. So these are the kind of studies that were done in America. This is the US Department of Energy. So you can see down here, it's a bit small, but I'll just kind of read it out. You've got production costs of $2 a kilo. So that's the magic mark. But the problem is, is that we still got what they're seeing is about six dollars, four to six dollars for delivery, and refueling costs alone is six to eight, six to eight dollars. So, and when you see in America, basically, thirteen to sixteen dollars is where they are at the moment, and that's the reason because of these kind of expensive delivery and refueling costs. Now, Shell came up, and this was a study done a couple of years ago. Um, Shell looked at the costs, and they looked at it and said, okay, it's going to cost about fifteen dollars a kilo. Okay, what do we got to get to? So their magic mark is about $5 a kilo to basically compete with gasoline and diesel. And that's what they're looking at at the moment. So, so that's where the kind of like say, um, uh, we've got to see basically two thirds of the costs to be cut out um, to get uh, hydrogen competitive. Now, there'll be a lot of low hanging fruit just, just by basically uh, increasing scale and repetition. Uh, in the manufacturing process, they'll bring those costs down quite dramatically. Again, a lot of it's going to come down to renewables. So renewables has been coming down quite a lot, but it's still got a long way to go. So I'm just going to quickly flip back to um, key numbers again. And kind of this is my last kind of one I wanted to kind of quickly show was um, 
the again this is just very simplistic it's not quite an economic model just very much like you know looking at a few key things which is basically the cost of the truck and basically your fuel costs over five years so these are the kind of things that a logistics company will be looking for so again uh there's a new zealand study i can put the the links and the notes and all that um where they compared a diesel truck to a hydrogen truck so again, uh, these are in New Zealand dollars, but I've just quickly converted into Australian. So they're talking again, uh, 175,000 for the truck. Let's assume you're 70, doing 75,000 as mileage per year. Uh, let's say you get your diesel costs. You're basically looking at just a very simplistic over five years, about $350,000 in costs. So what they're saying with the, with the test, with the, the Nikola, they're talking about the, the Nikola is about 500,000. So you saw the same thing with the, the Toyota Mirai. So the Mirai is at the moment, it's about $100,000 in America. Uh, and it's, oh, it must be, it might be getting down to about 60, 70 or something. But it's basically double the price of any other, like of normal cars and all that. So what you're seeing with the hydrogen truck is that it's going to be really expensive with those first few models and all that. Again, no matter how cheaply you get your, your hydrogen, even if you got it for free, you're still going to be, you know, it's, it's still going to be expensive in terms of the, the original truck. But I guess the biggest problem that I see with hydrogen trucks and all that is that you've got the, the electric trucks coming out. So at the moment, basically, the Tesla uh, semis are coming through and all that. Um, again, this New Zealand study came through as basically was about 30% more than the, the, a normal diesel truck. And again, the big question here is like, how much are they going to get for your electricity? So if you get grid electricity at 30 cents a kilowatt hour, you're almost on parity with a diesel truck. But what you can actually see is that what you'll find is that, do, you know, trucks are usually still, you know, like uh, you've got big logistics warehouses where basically it's got, you know, you've got a lot of room for solar panels on the roof. Even if you got that down to 10 cents a kilowatt hour, you're basically significantly reducing your OPEX costs for those trucks, which is a lot. I'm assuming that, I mean, you guys are the experts on the logistics side. It's all about getting cheap, cheap energy and all that. So that's the key things for me in terms of saying that, one of the challenges with hydrogen trucks is going to be that, yes, it can compete, it'll eventually compete with diesel, but can it compete with electric? Now, the, the other question, the other side of that is, is that charging times, um, everyone's saying, you know, you can't have a truck charging for a few hours. I think for a lot of use cases, you will see that kind of side of things coming through. And then also you're seeing a lot of technology around, say, fast charging and all that, where, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see charging get down to like half an hour for, you know, a regular, a regular break related to, you know, the usual mandatory breaks that, that truck drivers need for safety purposes and all that. So that's just some of the key numbers around the, say, the, uh, the energy side of things. Um, I'll hand it back over to uh, Michael now just to kind of discuss the, uh, the political side of things and all that. In terms of the policy landscape, in, in, our, um, in our brief that was on the website, it said, do all roads point to Canberra or lead to Canberra around the policy? And I think in, in many ways, it's, it's the opposite direction. Things are coming out of Canberra. The minister believes or has stated that solar and wind markets are mature, therefore they don't need uh, increased subsidisation. And obviously this is different between the various uh, major parties. But if we assume that that's the case, the next step is that the federal government is actually betting on technology to solve carbon emissions into the future. And they're selecting hydrogen as the, the major means of doing this. This begs the question, can the government actually pick winners in terms of technology? Now, some examples that we all remember, the government picked roof insulation, created a false market. It led to the deaths of people because of dodgy business practices leading to the, the end of a minister's career. Um, the National Broadband Network. Now, if you remember the talk around future proof, uh, that Malcolm Turnbull said that his model would change it and so on. And again, um, you know, whether you agree with the current approach of the NBN, I'm in regional New South Wales where we can't get NBN. We can only get ADSL and it's so unreliable. It's debilitating. Starlink is now available here and you can get 350 megabit connections in my region right now at around the same cost as the NBN. No one would have thought of Starlink uh, when the NBN was announced uh, some 13 years ago, or whatever it is now, CSIRO and its Wi-Fi, you know, this is a world-beating technology. The government didn't have the ability to harness that, that advance. Um, even where we have natural competitive advantage uh, in macadamia nuts, for example, Australia was not the major producer until around 2015. 
uh, Amer- the United States was, and now that honour has gone to South Africa. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that we can't control these outcomes, but by choosing one particular technology and focusing on that, the government is taking an extremely high-risk approach that history suggests is well, as a betting man, I wouldn't be backing this particular winner. <laughs> I wouldn't be. I wouldn't take on that risk. So it's quite a risky approach. It's not to say that it can't be done, but I think what we have to take into account is that there is a large element of consoling the resources industry interests. And if the resources industry can transition, um, then maybe that can be a good thing. And we've already got. Um, Twiggy Forrest talking about hydrogen as the the next big thing and being willing to invest heavily in that. So again, this is a good thing. Um, Now, whether or not we think consoling the resources industry is good or not, it's a reality that if we don't, all we have to look at is the last 10 years of politics to see what that industry can do to our ability to govern. So, you know, there are all these sorts of competing interests. And the trouble with politics is it's always about satisficing as opposed to providing the best outcome. The NBN was meant to present the best outcome, but if we'd actually satisficed, we could have had access to decent internet rather than world-class internet, um, as opposed to at the moment, unless you're with Starlink in regional New South Wales, for example, that you don't have that access. What we need to think about now, though, is what happens politically in a world where we have more expensive energy that actually needs more transport in order to bring down the costs of of the carbon emissions. And and what's it going to be like where transport is so prohibitive that all of our energy needs need to be locally sourced? There's there's a heavy infrastructure cost here. Um, Or do we have a, a cheap renewable energy world where instead of energy being dispatchable, we have to make our lives dispatchable. So basically we have to um, you know, manage ourselves uh, around that. So is this actually the end of uh, dispatchable energy and the beginning of a distributed or seasonal lifestyle for many of us? Now, the pandemic workplaces have demonstrated that it is possible. But let me put it into a more transport-related context. If you look at um, traffic congestion, one of the most efficient ways of dealing with traffic congestion is to make people sit in traffic. <laughs> you know, that's the most efficient way of dealing with it without costing anything extra. The cost is borne by the individual consumer of, of the road network. Um, another way to do it is to rearrange our lifestyles. So instead of everybody starting at nine and everybody finishing at five, we could avoid the morning and evening peak hours by simply staggering the times that we work. But whether or not this is culturally possible or practicable uh, is, is another question. So again, I think we've probably raised more questions than we provided answers, but I think what John's been able to present um, and, and look at it, uh, We've got a bit of time, I think, for questions, hopefully. Um, And I'd like you to take advantage of uh, John being here because he can probably demonstrate a few things. And if it's the first time you've seen key numbers, um, it it takes a little bit of sort of getting used to. But once you get used to it, it's absolutely, it's very powerful because you can start asking questions like, but what if you change the price of hydrogen to this or fuel to that? And it really gives you all this ability to look at the impact of scenarios uh, based on the available data at this point in time. Uh, So the next slide, please, John. Um, What we've done on my website at politicalscience.com.au, we have access to the PowerPoint uh, slides from today, uh, but also uh, keynumbers.com is John's website where you can uh, look at uh, more information. So um, that uh, concludes the presentation. Uh, Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's uh, it's, uh, we've really enjoyed the, uh, the opportunity. Um, and uh, over to you now for questions. Thanks, John, and thanks, Stephen.